Warning, the following episode contains elements of horror that may be unsuitable for listeners under the age of 13. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Beyond the Bazaar, a podcast curated to all things, well, bizarre. My name is Brianna, and I will be sharing with you urban legends, lore, ghost stories, and more from around our planet. Hello everyone, welcome to a brand new episode of Beyond the Bazaar podcast. I'm your host Brianna and we are back with our 8th episode of season 2 of the podcast. So as I shared with you guys last week, we are doing our end of summer horrors bit like we did last year on season 1. Just kind of the wrap up the summer, ramp up for back to school, you know, just to get ourselves in the mood for that spooky fall season that we all love so much. So on our second episode of our end of summer horrors special on Beyond the Bazaar, um, I would like to share with you all a favorite creepypasta of mine. Now this creepypasta was first posted to the No Sleep subreddit back in June of 2013. And I find due to the theme that it's the perfect end of summer story. This creepypasta is known as a campfire story, which centers around, you guessed it, a campfire. So you can see why it's a favorite and it's perfect for this time of year. So if you're around a campfire, gather around. If you're in bed, snuggle in. And if you're in your office or in the car, just lay back and relax because it's time for a campfire story. For a number of years, I was a camp counselor at an overnight camp in the Muskokas. I loved it more than any job I've ever had. Despite the non-existent pay, annoying campers, long days and short nights, crappy food, etc. For one, I got to tell as many scary stories as I could sputter out. There was nothing more better than hanging around a dying campfire with a bunch of junior high kids who were demanding the scariest, most blood-curdling tales I knew. And I told them all. The babysitter in the eerie clown statue, the driver in the creepy gas attendant, the woman and her licking dog. I saved my best stories for the overnight trips we made in the Algonquian Park. For non-Canadians, it's a massive park in the middle of Ontario, spanning nearly 8,000 square kilometers. When days would be spent canoeing on pristine lakes and nights would be spent around the fire, singing and making s'mores, and being as rowdy as the only people within miles could be. Once the kids had quieted down, I told them stories of a stalker in the woods with a face so horrifying it paralyzed all of its victims in fear or the group of campers who decided to spend a night across the lake from an abandoned, or was it, a sane asylum. On this particular night, I had finished up the tales, once again insisting that they were entirely true, and sent the campers to their tents. It had been an exhausting day, and none of the six kids were in any mood to stay up later. My fellow counselor had also decided to pack it in, leaving just me on a falling log next to the dying fire. I took a deep breath of the cool, fresh, pine-scented air and looked out at the lake. The partial moon reflected off the glassy water, and on the other side I could see towering cliffs going up several hundred feet. I considered whether we could canoe over, climb up on a few dozen feet, and do some cliff jumping. I grinned. The camp director would have had my head if we did that. 
well, if he found out. Movement at the very top of the cliffs caught my eye. There was a small light bobbing along the peak. At first I thought it was a star, but it was larger and gave off a golden glow. It started moving back and forth in a small arc. As I sat up and watched it, another appeared next to it, bobbing along the top of the cliff, then another, and another, and a few more. My stomach dropped to my feet. I grabbed my bag and pulled my digital camera out, then focused it on the little glowing orbs and used the zoom function. I counted them, and then I counted again. Oh shit. In a flash, I was up and running to the tents. Hey guys, wake up, we gotta go. There was movement in the tents, and then I had seven confused heads looking out at me. My co-counselor wore a mixture of concern and pure anger. I hate to do this, I continued, but the clouds are looking really threatening. There's a big rainstorm coming in. If we get caught in it, it's going to ruin our trip. Seriously? Laura, my co-counselor, asked. We're in the middle of the woods. Where would we go? I pulled a map and flashlight out of my bag. There's a ranger station a few kilometers south of us. I traced the path with my fingers. Thank God. We can make it there in a few hours. The campers groaned. Can't we just go in the morning? No, I shouted, my voice echoing across the lake. I lowered it. Come on, let's get packed up and go. I'll tell you a story along the way. I smiled, though I could feel my lips quivering. It's my best one. That seemed to get them going, and within ten minutes the tents were packed up and we'd begun our trek into the deep woods, with small flashlights our only guide. When I was confident we were moving at a steady pace, I allowed myself to relax and began to tell my favorite campfire story. Centuries before, the European settlers made their way into the country. It was inhabited by the First Nations people. They had made the trip across Western Canada, following the migration patterns of large animals such as buffalo and bison. Eventually, they reached Ontario, at which point they split off into smaller groups of travelers, each searching for a section of land to call their own. Legend has it, that one group consisting of about 20 men, women, and children had ventured through this very area in search of a place to call home. Though it wasn't even the end of October, the weather had made a turn for the worse, and the group journeyed around the lake. A fierce blizzard hit. Within an hour, the group found themselves in blinding snow and below zero temperatures. The clothes they had on them were made for the fall, not for this sort of weather, and there weren't any Canada goose jackets around back then. But they pressed on. They didn't have any other choice. Night was falling as they reached a cliff bluff, which towered over a cold, choppy lake. There was no stopping for this group. They'd die if they didn't make it past the cliffs. But with darkness setting in and the snow falling even harder, visibility was almost non-existent. So one of the elders had an idea. Using the little kerosene they had left, he lit a lantern for each of the travelers and had them carry it in front of them. Not so that they could see the cliffs, but so they could see who was in front of them, allowing them to all follow each other across the narrow bluffs. With the strongest of the men leading the way, the group began to cross the cliffs. The freezing wet snow soaked every bone in their body. The harsh wind chilled any exposed skin and threatened to push them right off the rock. Their path was no more than a few feet wide and would have been slippery to even the best hiking boots, let alone hand-fashioned moccasins. Slowly, painstakingly slowly, 
they made their way up the cliffs, praying that whatever lay on the other side could shelter them from this intensifying storm. They were about halfway up, hundreds of feet above the lake, though it was well out of their vision. In fact, all they could see in this blinding storm was the lantern in front of them, acting as a beacon to guide their steps. If the light moved up, they moved up. If it went down, they moved down. Each of the travelers was almost in a trance, caring about nothing but the glowing orb a few feet away. For the leader, though, there was no such luxury. He moved bl forward blindly, filling along the cliffs with his free arm. Though his skin was so numb, he could barely feel anything. As the path wound back again, he made a misstep and lost his footing, just as a gust of wind blasted his back. He desperately grasped for the hold, but his frozen fingers couldn't get anything. With a terrifying scream, he slipped off the cliffs and fell into the icy black lake. The rest of the party didn't see him fall, of course. All they saw was his glowing orb dropping away from the bluff and disappearing into the darkness. There was no time to mourn. They continued on, but the storm was worsening. After another minute, one of the children, his body unable to withstand the cold, dropped away, his lantern glowing until the choppy waters put it out. Another, having seen this, lost his balance and fell. This pattern went on until there were just five people left, fumbling along in the darkness, following the light in front. As hard as they tried, the cliffs were unforgiving. The remaining men fell down to four, then three, then two, and then there was just one left, who legend says cursed the earth as his legs slipped and he plunged hundreds of feet down, his lantern, the last one to be extinguished. Of the 20 camp members who tried to overcome the cliffs, I finished, not one of them survived. They say that sometimes when the conditions are right, you can see the orbs along the cliff, symbols of the lost travelers who will never find their homes. As the story ended, leaving the campers in an airy silence, I saw lights up ahead. A wave of relief poured over me. We picked up the pace and found the ranger station bursting with activity, with a half dozen people running around, loading up trucks and shouting into radios. The wind was beginning to really pick up, and I heard thunder in the distance. Hey you kids, a large burly man with a full beard and mustache ran up to us. Get in the trucks, we don't have much time. Laura and I led the kids to one of the pickup trucks. What's going on? I asked the man. Didn't you hear? Another gust of wind. Huge storm systems heading right for us. Already been tornadoes touched down. We're getting everyone out of here. Let's go. We all climbed into the truck's bed. I collapsed down, feeling like I've just been punched in the gut. The ranger climbed into the front and we took off down a makeshift road. My head was spinning. It wasn't possible. How? Laura slid next to me, keeping her voice low. How do you know that we had to get out of there? I looked over at her. My face felt empty of any blood. I, I saw the lights. What? No, no, she gasped then caught herself. How many? I took a deep breath. Eight. She looked around at all the campers who were now lying against each other, asleep, despite the bumpy road. That's all of us. My God. I nodded and leaned against her. Laura had heard the traveler's story before, and she knew that I had left out a key bit of information. The lights were real, but they were never random. If they were shining, bobbing back and forth, swinging in a small arc, it was because they had a message, a warning. One light was shine, 
for each person who is about to die. <laughs> I so love that story so much. I think it's I think it's really, really perfect story. Um, creepy, perfect blend of creepy, urban legend, you know, just perfect blend. And it was kind of like a story within a story. Like you have the camp counselor telling the story to the um, campers and we're also hearing that he's telling the story or she's telling the story. So I think that was really one of the best elements of the story, in my opinion. And I can't remember if I shared this at the beginning, but the campfire story, well, a campfire story is what it's called, was posted on the No Sleep subreddit by author Vital Duel. That's their username, Vital underscore Duel. So I did want to give a shout out to them that this was um, posted by them. And it's an incredible story and it's become a favorite of mine. And it's just, I just love it. One of the things I did find myself asking uh, myself when I was, when I have read it a few years ago, when I read this story, I asked myself, I was like, if because obviously the camp counselor that's telling the story saw the lights and he decided to get the camp well he or she decided to get the camp counsel well not the camp counselors <laughs> the campers up out of bed you know he saw the lights obviously and knew what it meant so the only thing that kind of puzzled me is that why would he decide to tell them that particular well he or she decided to tell the campers that particular story you know, I guess, I don't know, just to kind of ease their own mind or to just kind of distract them. And that's the only story they could think of since they saw the lights. But it was just something that wouldn't have eased my own mind if I knew that that was the story. And that was the whole lore that, you know, however many lights are shining is how many people are going to die, which in this case is probably the ranger, the two counselors and the children with them, which is sad if you think about it. But, you know, at the same time, it's it's really Story-wise, it's a, it makes for a good story. And I also love that the story had, like I said, a, a little bit of influence of urban legend. Like the stories that the camp counselor is sharing, the urban legends locally in that area. The story itself about the travelers that were traveling through the icy mountains and fell off one by one. That's kind of like an urban legend. So I like that the author who wrote this story included that little bit of urban legend so it's like a urban legend within a story so it's like really really cool really really cool touch and besides most campfire stories I find happen to be usually urban legends when I hear campfire stories like if I'm around a fire around a bonfire or campfire or whatever I kind of like to hear um, stories that kind of center around wherever environment I'm in like if I'm in the woods you know I want to hear something about the woods just or if I'm in like on the beach or in the backyard I want to hear something like about that particular environment because it adds the creep factor and scary factor so much more we're actually in that environment and that kind of brings me back to when I was wondering how come the camp council decided to tell that particular tale to the camp counselors as they were well the campers not the camp counselors <laughs> the campers as they were evacuating their campsite I guess the camp the camp counselor decided to do that because it was just a sense of familiarity and just to kind of add that scary touch as they were used to doing in many years past as being a camp counselor so that's probably where that stemmed from now that I think about it so that does leave one question since the camp counselor is supposedly telling the story does that mean that they survived did the campers survive the ranger Laura the co-counselor you know since they're obviously telling this story you know, from a from a present perspective, did they survive this storm or are they telling it from beyond the beyond or, you know, wherever? You know, it just kind of begs the question. I always kind of think about stuff like that after I read stories such as this where the main character is facing some type of doom or, you know, certain demise and we're reading it from their perspective. Like, did they die? Are they alive? I guess it's just my the way my brain works and going into overthinking mode. I don't know. But it's something I always kind of question. But if the council did survive, hopefully, you know, they are able to tell more and more stories to many more campers to come. Just as I hope that we here at Beyond the Bizarro be here to share with you all so many more creepypastas, urban legends, rituals, lore, and many years to come as well. <laughs> 
So with that being said, y'all have a great night. And we'll be back next week with another episode of Beyond the Bazaar and our end of summer horror special final episode. So until then, you already know, stay bizarre. Good night.